what is up everybody welcome back to mile higher podcast episode 119 today we are here to do a episode that we wanted to do for a really long time and we're going to be talking about the assassination of martin luther king and the conspiracy around it and you know let you guys know what we think about it yeah it's one of those that is just as intriguing as like the jfk assassination i mean it's just as deep conspiracy wise Mm -hmm. and Honestly, there's a lot of clear-cut evidence to suggest that there was, you know, parties that conspired in order to have MLK assassinated. So we're going to dive deep into that today. But before we get into all of that, we've got a couple news stories for you as well. But I also want to thank our sponsors for today, Stamps, HelloFresh, and Purple. Also, if you guys haven't checked out my new podcast, Lights Out, uh, I just released an episode today actually on Jeffrey Dahmer. Uh, Definitely a crazy, crazy individual sick individual yeah seriously josh was telling me a little bit about it i do not like to hear details around people like jeffrey dahmer it's way too dark for me you know and i know people want us to talk about stuff like that on mile higher but it's just way too uh, it really fucks with me hearing about the kind of stuff that he did but i know people are very fascinated in it so that's why it's perfect you have lights out now and you can kind of go into these topics that i just won't (laughs) talk about Yeah, exactly. I mean, and we kind of focus a lot more on the paranormal as well as far as like hauntings and Mm -hmm. ghosts and, you know, demonic possession and things like that. We've covered a number of Ed and Lorraine cases. So if you're interested in, you know, ghost stories and serial killers and dark events, we did an episode on Columbine as well. Definitely check out the Lights Out podcast. So I'll put that uh, info for you below. So our first story this week is revolving around Richard Brooks, which Richard Brooks was a 27 year old black man who was shot and killed by an Atlanta police officer named Garrett Rolf and officer Garrett Rolf shot him for seemingly no reason because Richard Brooks was just basically asleep at a Wendy's drive through when they showed up and things escalated very quickly. There was a struggle and then a seemingly what happened was Richard grabbed the officer's taser and then a, a chase ensued and then he turned around to shoot the taser at the officer and then the officer shot three shots and ended up killing Richard Brooks, which just doesn't seem justified. No, it doesn't seem necessary at all. He did not need to shoot his weapon at this person. He could have let him go and waited until backup came. I mean, you certainly did not have to shoot him. Well, yeah, because I mean, a taser is not going to kill you. So the officer's life wasn't at risk there necessarily. I guess what he could have been worried about is if he was tased, then maybe he would have grabbed his actual gun. That was a concern. But regardless, I mean... Well, he didn't grab his actual gun yet. So you can't just assume people are going to do that and then murder them. Right. I mean, as a police officer, you sign up to de-escalate situations like this from people that are out of control or breaking the law. You sign up. It's your job to bring the situation down and de-escalate it without killing them without firing your weapon at them yeah absolutely i mean mean, there's just no excuse yeah it's completely unnecessary and i think at this point there was multiple officers at the scene Mm -hmm. uh, as well so there's just literally no reason for him to actually shoot and kill richard brooks and apparently when after he did shoot brooks he not only failed to provide first aid because that's what you're supposed to do as an officer Mm -hmm. you're supposed to if you shoot somebody then you're supposed to go render aid to them immediately to try and save their life i mean the, the goal at the end of the day for any police officer is not to kill anybody. It should If you be. have to, right, if you have to fire your weapon in order to defend yourself or to disarm somebody, you're supposed to then immediately start giving first aid in an attempt to save the person's life. I mean, mm-hmm. that's what your job is as a first responder. And apparently after he had shot Brooks, he actually yelled, I got him before starting to kick him as he's dying on the ground. So not rendering aid Why would all. you do that? Completely unnecessary. And then also... There's no footage of the incident. There was like a picture captured that somebody else captured of them like beating him on the ground, but conveniently their body cams were disabled. So after this incident occurred, obviously people in Atlanta were extremely pissed and Mm -hmm. there was, you know, more protesting and all of that. So actually, and actually the police chief, Erica Shields, ended up resigning as a result of this incident because, I mean, it came at literally the worst time. I I mean, there's no good time for this. Exactly. I mean, they're not thinking at this Mm -hmm. point. And so this just kind of flamed everything back up again. But the DA actually is going to charge or charge Garrett Rolf uh, with 11 charges, including felony murder. Good. He could face 99 years in prison. And I think the death penalty is still on the table. Good. Finally, some justice. Which is 
wild to hear that happen to a police officer. We're just so accustomed to mm. police yeah, officers, you know, getting deals or getting off completely that to actually have an officer held to the same standard as you would hold anybody else is, is a good thing, yes. you know, step in the right direction. And Absolutely. I agree. But do you think they would have acted so quickly if we weren't in the middle of this heated moment, you know, would they have done this two months ago? Yeah. That's How would they have been as quick? Probably not. I don't think so. Either. And I think this chief of police has some questionable decisions in the past. And it's partly kind of why she resigned is that she kind of turned a, mm. a blind eye to some previous incidents. So mm. the, the DA, yeah, the DA stepping up and, you know, pressing charges to the full degree against former officer Garrett Rolf. Whether he will actually be convicted of those charges and how much time he'll get, you know, is up for debate. Yeah. I mean, I assume the fact that they're coming at him with such serious charges, I mean, felony murder is no, mm -hmm. you know, that's not a basic charge by any means. So, mm -hmm. I assume that they're confident that they're going to, you know, get that through and, and convict him of that. So I think it's, we're seeing changes in our system already. And just, you know, if hopefully this keeps up, hopefully this is not just a direct result right. of all the protests and all that. Hopefully we see it, you know, when this topic isn't as popular in the media and on social media, hopefully we see this a year from now, you know, happen as quickly as we're seeing justice happen here, because it's got to make people angry that have had missed justices in the past. And they're looking at this situation and being like, wow, why wasn't my loved one? Why was there not justice for my loved one? Absolutely. You know, it's the same or very similar situations. Absolutely. And I'm just worried though, because I feel like in a lot of, you know, normal circumstances in the past, this would not have happened at all. Cause based upon what had happened, I think that in a lot of cases, there's probably cases out there exactly like this one where, you know, they turned a non-lethal weapon onto an officer and an officer shoots them and then, mm -hmm. you know, they justify the, you know, means of force. So I just hope that this isn't just a one-time incident where they're actually going through with such serious charges and then in the future it's going to get laxed again because that, that's, that could happen. You know, we just mm -hmm. don't know. Hopefully the changes are permanent. But the thing about this particular case is that a ton of Atlanta police officers walked off the job. Yes. In protest mm -hmm. of, of the charges against uh, Garrett Rolf. They don't think it's fair or that it's justified that he's facing felony murder for That's what absurd. happened. I'm sorry. I just completely disagree with that. Yeah. I mean, it's, again, it comes back to, you know, you're given this, this power to uphold the law and to, you know, law and order, but. And you're not just given that, this power. It's not, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but. You're not given this power. You are, you're supposed to earn this. You're supposed to sign up. It's your job. You're being paid. You know, like why are these people not understanding what their job is? There's two people involved in this situation normally, an officer and a civilian. It is not, only one person is getting paid. Only one person is there doing a job. Why can they not just do their job? And why are they defending someone who clearly didn't do what they were supposed to do at their fucking job? I just don't understand the logic behind it. Well, again, I think the perspective from the officer standpoint, because I've seen even a lot of officers that are on social media and TikTok stars and things like that talk about mm -hmm. this and, and lend their support to the Atlanta officers that are walking out and protesting the charges against him. Because a lot of those officers are saying that there was justification for him to shoot Richard Brooks, but that it's unfortunate that he killed him, but the means of force was justified because he took an officer's taser and turned it on him. And the, you know, the end result could have been differently, but a lot of, I've definitely seen a lot of officers out there that are supporting the protest against this. Well, I just don't think that you have any reason to shoot someone if they don't have a weapon that can kill you. It just doesn't make any sense. Again, back off. You know, that's the, the right move here would have been to let him run off with the taser, yeah. wait for more backup to, to come before mm -hmm. you make that split decision to pull, you know, a deadly weapon out and use it on somebody that can't kill you in that moment. So right. it's, yeah, it's. And especially when he's running away. How right. many cases have we seen of black people being shot as they're running yeah. away? Yeah, There he, is no fucking reason to do that, period. Yeah, he was shot in the back. Mm -mm. Well, and the other problem too is he's just he fired three shots, and one of them almost hit and killed passengers in a vehicle. 
Oh my God. So that's the problem too, is if you just start going wild west and start just firing yeah. off bullets that you could potentially fuck? kill an innocent bystander. So oh that, that's a, another big no, no is that you don't do that. That's mm -hmm. you know, really bad. So yeah, I mean, this is a developing situation and it's definitely very controversial. A lot of people have a lot of opinions about it. A lot of people that support the police think that this is overblown. Does he deserve to be fired? Yes. Does he deserve to face you know, life in prison or the death penalty over this, some are saying no. But again, we'll, we'll have to wait and see what happens with the DA. But mm. well, with that being said, let's go ahead and get into the Martin Luther King assassination conspiracy because we've got a lot to cover today. But before we get into that, we'd like to thank our sponsors for today. Technology has improved just about everything, right? Phones, cars, shopping, yet mattresses have more or less been the same since the invention of sleep. But we deserve better. And finally, the mattress has evolved thanks to Purple. The secret to Purple is the Purple Grid. It's a patented comfort technology that instantly adapts to your body's natural shape and sleep style. Purple is for everybody, no matter how you sleep. Not only that, Purple has some of the best pillows out there. I got a chance to try the Purple Pillow, which is probably one of the most comfortable pillows I've ever slept on. It's got that Purple Grid technology built into it, so it always stays cool. Plus, you can adjust it to whatever firmness you need. Experience the next revolution of sleep. Go to purple.com slash mile higher and use promo code mile higher. For a limited time, you'll get $150 off any purple mattress order of $1,500 or more. That's purple.com slash mile higher, promo code mile higher for $150 off any mattress order of $1,500 or more. Terms apply. So we all know right now we need to be avoiding crowded places as much as possible. But what if you need to go to the post office? Well, don't worry guys, stamps.com is here to help. With stamps.com, you can print postage on demand and skip those lines and crowds at the post office. Plus you can actually save some money with discounts that you can't even get at the post office. And if that wasn't enough, stamps.com also offers UPS services with discounts up to 62% and no UPS residential surcharges. Stamps.com brings all the services of the U.S. Postal Service right to your computer in the safety and comfort of your own home, office, or anywhere else that you're hunkering down right now. Whether you're a small business sending out invoices, an online seller shipping out products, or you're just working from home and need to mail stuff, Stamps.com can handle it all with ease. So right now, our listeners can get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus postage in a digital scale without any long-term commitment. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in mile higher. That's stamps.com and enter in the code mile higher. Stay safe, my friends. If you haven't tried HelloFresh, then what are you doing? Get fresh pre-measured ingredients and mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door with HelloFresh. It's America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh lets you skip those trips to the grocery store and makes home cooking fun and affordable. HelloFresh's pre-portioned ingredients mean there's less prep for you and less food waste. One of my favorite things, though, that HelloFresh does is their bistro burgers. And one of them recently I had was a Gouda Vibes burger, which was really delicious. Another reason why I love HelloFresh is because they've donated over 2.5 million meals to charity in 2019 alone. So what are you waiting for? Go to HelloFresh.com slash 60 mile higher and use code 60 mile higher to get $60 off your first three weeks, including free shipping on your first box. Additional restrictions apply please visit HelloFresh.com for more details. Again, go to HelloFresh.com slash 60 mile higher and use code 60 mile higher to get $60 off your first three weeks, including free shipping on your first box. Again, additional restrictions apply, but please visit HelloFresh.com for more details. So let's get into Martin Luther King Jr. And before we talk about his assassination and you know the conspiracy theories around it, I really wanted to just talk about him for a second because he is such a profound individual and somebody who I feel completely changed the world and for the better, obviously. But I agree, I agree with that. We watched a film last night called King in the Wilderness and it was excellent. It had me in tears at the end because yeah. it just was, I had never really, you know, it's, it's such a shame that like our schools don't dive deeper into mm. the civil rights movement. Like, you know, and I never took like a black history course or anything like that in college or, or high school or anything like that. So I really didn't know that much about, you know, the details of his life and all the different things that he did for all people too, and not just black people, but for just humankind. And 
I got to say the King in the Wilderness by HBO was really, really good. It's basically his life story told by the people closest to him, his friends and family. And it really just gives you a all new perspective on who he was and all of the things that he was about. And yeah, I got to say it was, it was really, really good. Yeah, it's really well done. And it really does put into perspective what the end of his life kind of looked like the last few years and some of his struggles that he was going through with his family and just the toll that being, you know, such a profound leader and having so many people look to you for the answers was really hard for him. And at the end of his life, he was really struggling with the idea of violence and whether or not you should use violence because he was always about nonviolence, but there were other people that were really starting to push that, you know what, sometimes you need to use violence to get your message across. And he was really struggling trying to be the one that was still anti-violence because a lot of people kind of were turning on him at the end of his life. And I think it's really good to watch this documentary too that we were talking about, King in the Wilderness, because it does show you kind of a, I guess, I mean, it's not a conspiracy documentary, obviously, and they still, there's still plenty of moments in that where you're like, holy shit, that's crazy. You never hear about this. You never hear how the government treated him here. Like there's so much that's just not talked about. And like you said, in our education system, it's the biggest, I mean, they skip over it so much of what actually happened, like many topics with history. Yeah. One of the big things for me was just the fact that he, he did have, you know, contact on a fairly regular basis with not only the FBI, but the president himself. Yes, he did. President Johnson at the time. Yeah, Johnson was trying to get advice from him in some situations, but he was also, a lot of people put pressure on him to kind of crack down on King, and there was just a very strained relationship. Right, especially since, you know, Dr. King really started representing more than just the civil rights movement. Yes, became that was the big thing. about you know, anti-war and poverty and yeah. human rights and, you know, much broader, you know, issues that, you know, affect everybody. And, you know, who's starting to get a huge, huge following of people of all walks of life mm -hmm. that were starting to unite behind him. So mm -hmm. that's kind of what we're going to really talk about uh, when we dive into the conspiracies is just you start to realize how powerful of an individual he really became, especially at the end of his life, as far as how much influence he had over people and how much people really listened to him and, and what they said. Mm -hmm. And just about why the government was starting to feel threatened by him. And we'll, of course, get into this more, but many, many people just don't realize how threatened the government seems, or the FBI, were by Martin Luther King because he was so powerful and he was really speaking to people and wasn't, you know, working with them in any way. In fact, Martin Luther King, in his, you know, quest for nonviolence, decided to come out against the Vietnam War. And that's going to be something we go over here because that was just such a huge moment in his career to be against the president and against the U.S., you know, acting in other countries the way yeah. that we are trying to stop them from acting here. Exactly. Well, it was the nonviolent movement that he was mm, leading and the right. fact that the U.S. at the time was in Vietnam, you know, in a war that I still don't even understand why no we were in Vietnam. Knows. It doesn't make any sense. It was like, ridiculous. If you Google it, it, it's basically we wanted to stop the spread of communism, but yeah. that's it. There's like no clear cut reason for why we were there. And obviously, you know, during the 1960s, that was like such a huge, huge thing that was going on. So it's interesting how you know, his movement evolved and became this ultra powerful thing at the end of his life. And then obviously it continued beyond that. Mm -hmm. But before we get to, to that part of it, let's go back a little bit and talk about, you know, where he came from, kind of a little bit of his early life, because he is truly a, a special human being, I believe. Like, I think mm -hmm. there's a clear reason he was here on this earth and, and he did what he did because, I mean, he's just... You don't see people like mm -hmm. that very he's often. So, like the way he speaks, the way he's able to put his thoughts into words and motivate people with those words was unmatched. I mean, he was truly so eloquent when he spoke and so smart, just such a smart person. Yeah, extremely smart. He, I like to think, you know, there's certain individuals over the course of history that yeah. really have a huge impact on the world and change things for either. Uh, the better or the worse. And, you know, like Nikola Tesla and people like that, where, 
you know, without them, we might be in a different place. Albert Einstein, people like that. There's brilliant minds that, you know, we only see, it feels like a few times in a generation. And he Mm -hmm. was definitely one of them. So Martin Luther King Jr. was born on January 15th, 1929. And he was actually born Michael Luther King Jr. But he later changed his name to Martin. So Martin actually came from a long line of pastors that ran the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. And his grandfather had actually served the church from 1914 to 1931. And then Martin's father then took over and served from that point on until the present. And from 1960 up until his death, Martin Luther King Jr. acted as the co-pastor, basically. He was kind of second behind his father. So growing up, Dr. King attended segregated public schools in Georgia and graduated from high school at the age of 15. Brilliant. Yeah. And he received the BA degree in 1948 from Morehouse College, which is a distinguished Negro institution of Atlanta from which both his father and grandfather also graduated from. And after three years of theological study at Crozer Theological Seminary in Pennsylvania, where he actually was elected president of a predominantly white senior class, he was awarded the BD in 1951. So after graduating seminary school, he then enrolled in graduate studies at Boston University, where he completed his residence for the doctorate in 1953 and then received the actual degree in 1955. It was also at that point in time when he was in Boston that he met and married Coretta Scott, who was honestly like the perfect woman for him. I feel like she matched him in almost every way with mm-hmm. her intelligence. I mean, she can, the way she, she spoke was like mm-hmm. almost the same as him. I mean, they're both just such eloquent speakers. Yeah. She was excellent. She also cared about the movement just as much as him and cared before she even met him. Yeah. Yeah. She was already, you know, leading marches and things like that mm-hmm. before he had even met her. Yeah. She was also a true activist. Mm hmm. And after they got married, they ended up having two sons and two daughters. Then in 1954, Martin Luther King became pastor of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. And he was always a strong worker for civil rights for members of his race. And by this time, he was also a member of the executive committee of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, which is a leading organization of its kind in the nation. This then led him to essentially lead the famous bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama in December 1955. The boycott lasted 382 days, and on December 21st, 1956, after the Supreme Court of the United States had declared unconstitutional the laws requiring segregation on buses, blacks and whites rode the buses as equals. And during the days of the boycott, Martin was actually arrested, and his home was bombed at one point. He was also subjected to personal abuse, but at the same time, he emerged as this great leader of black people. In 1957, he was elected president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which is an organization formed to provide new leadership for the civil rights movement, which was struggling a bit at the time. And the ideals for this organization he took from Christianity with operational techniques from Gandhi. And in the 11 year period between 1957 and 1968, Dr. King traveled over 6 million miles and spoke over 2,500 times appearing wherever there was injustice, protest, and action. And meanwhile, he wrote five books as well as numerous articles. That's one of the things that just completely impresses me is his ability to constantly be on the go, constantly being able to speak at, you know, whenever he is needed and give speech after speech after Mm -hmm. speech and just flawless every time. He worked endlessly. Like he didn't know when to stop, you know, Fighting. He felt guilty if he ever was resting. And that was becoming a problem, though, in his personal life. Like, his family was really missing him. His kids were really suffering without him because he was gone all the time, working all the time. Yeah. I mean, he was a workaholic. But again, this is not, you know, this is so important that you can't really equate it to anything else. And that's how he felt is he's like, I have to keep this up. This is my mission. Yeah. Like, there's no stopping for me until all of our goals are met. And he always knew that. We were making little bits of progress, but to meet the end goal, it would take a very long time and a ton of work. He also seemed to know that he had limited time to do this work. He always seemed to have a sense that he could possibly die young, that his life may not be long. Like in a lot of ways, he kind of predicted his own death. And I feel like because he had, you know, he felt like he was going to have a shorter amount of time that he had to spend that time 
well. Yeah, is what like he pedal said. to the metal, like mm-hmm. constantly. And yeah. he did, I mean, essentially predict his own death in a lot of ways. I mean, he, he spoke about it a number of times that, you know, he wasn't sure how long he would be able to keep going. But until, you know, he was no longer alive, he was going to be fighting for, you know, for all of us really, but for black people specifically. Also during this 11 year period, he led a massive protest in Birmingham, Alabama, which caught the attention of the entire world, providing what he called a coalition of conscience and inspired his letter from Birmingham jail, a manifesto of the black revolution. He planned the drives in Alabama for the registration of blacks as voters, and he directed the peaceful march on Washington, DC, which 250,000 people tuned in to hear his famous address I have a dream. That's one of the best speeches of all time, for sure. It is probably the best speech of all time. Mm -hmm. Not only that, he met with President John F. Kennedy and campaigned for President Lyndon B. Johnson at one point. He was arrested in upwards of 20 times and assaulted at least four times. He was awarded five honorary degrees. He was named Man of the Year by Time Magazine in 1963 and became not only the symbolic leader of American blacks, but also a world figure. At the age of 35, Martin Luther King Jr. was also the youngest man to have received the Nobel Peace Prize. And when he was told that he was selected, he announced that he would turn over the prize money of $54,123 in order to further the civil rights movement. He didn't take any of that money for himself, but put it right back into the movement. So that kind of gives you a good understanding of, you know, very brief. Obviously, there's tons of, you know, detail in that. But we're focusing on, you know, the conspiracy aspect of his assassination, which we're going to get into in a minute, but hopefully that gives you a little bit of a, you know, understanding if you didn't already know, you know, the life of Martin Luther King Jr. So before we actually talk about his assassination, it's important to know what was going on around that time in his life. So on the evening of April 3rd, 1968, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. had just returned to Memphis and for over a year as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, also abbreviated SCLC, He had been planning the Poor People's Campaign, which was an attempted expansion of the civil rights movement, which would obviously include economic and human rights for poor Americans of diverse backgrounds. And that was what was interesting is this campaign was to bring together, you know, all walks of life. I mean, he reached out to Native Americans and Hispanics and And poor white people, poor white people even, and brought them all together to, you know, unite against unfair wages and just, Mm -hmm. you know, the system, especially back then, was really, really messed up. And especially for minorities and people with poor backgrounds or just came from poverty, it was very hard to make it. And at that period of time, Memphis was definitely going through some shit because people were really upset. There was a huge sanitation strike. Yeah, the sanitation workers were being treated like absolute like garbage. Mm-hmm. And obviously, it was mostly black sanitation workers who actually went on strike 1300 to be exact uh, this happened in February and they were seeking union recognition dues check off and an increase to their dollar 65 to two dollars and ten cent hourly wage that is disgusting I mean I know it's inflation and it's a long time ago but still that's so low I, I don't even know how it's you just survive. insulting yeah I mean you have to take into consideration inflation but even then I mean it was probably at least a few dollars more per hour for you know, what, what white people were making at the time. So, but not only that, the working conditions that they were working in were absolutely dreadful. Mm -hmm. Um, and what had happened was two sanitation workers were crushed to death inside their own garbage trucks. Yeah. They weren't safe at all. No, they were so janky looking. I was Mm -hmm. like, I can't believe they would, they'd have to like climb in there to get the trash out. I'm pretty sure. And they could just like get crushed inside of them. So they were pissed and they wanted, you know, they wanted basic, benefits and Mm -hmm. basic rights when it comes to the already shitty job they're doing as far as sanitation goes. But Dr. King really thought that this was something that he wanted to to step into. But the main thing with this was that he was worried about things turning violent Mm -hmm. and he seemed to try to go to places where things might've gotten really violent, lots of rioting in order to calm it down. And actually try to affect real change there and get people on board with his movement versus, you know, what the other people were doing. Yeah. Like even right before this, he had spent a bunch of time in California where there were riots going on there and he was brought in as kind of like the peacemaker. 
peacekeeper, I guess, to speak to everyone and, and guide them. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, he was in contact with the mayors of a lot of these cities too. And mm -hmm. he would, you know, they kind of looked to him and be like, Hey, can you help us calm down what's going on? There's a lot of unrest here. And so he would go in and, and attempt to get people to join his, his movement and, you know, convert from being violent and looting to being peaceful. But while in Memphis on the evening of April 3rd, Dr. King was actually back at the motel in bed in his pajamas, mm -hmm. you know, ready to go to sleep when, you know, there was a gathering of people at the Bishop Charles Mason temple where his other people, Jesse Jackson, were there to meet with the people there and talk to them. And they were all hoping that Martin Luther King would show up. Yeah, he was actually sick all day and wasn't planning to be able to get up, but he he did because there were so many people waiting for him and were hoping that he would come and speak. And he did. He gave one of the most moving speeches that he's ever given. And it says a lot. We're going to play part of the speech. I think it's really important to watch the entire thing, though, if you have time. It's really interesting. And there were a lot of moments where he kind of alluded that he thought maybe the end of his life was near. Yeah, it's, it's kind of eerie, honestly, when you watch it. We've got to give ourselves to this struggle until the end. Nothing would be more tragic than to stop at this point in Memphis. I want to thank God once more for allowing me to be here with you. I left Atlanta this morning and then I got into Memphis. And some began to say the threats, or talk about the threats that were out. Uh, what would happen to me from some of our sick white brothers? Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. That is one of the most powerful mm -hmm. speeches or quotes I, I think I've ever heard. It's this, I mean, knowing what was going to happen the next day, it is really one of the most profound moments in a speech ever. I get full body chills hearing him talk every time he says that one. I'm not worried about anyone. I'm not fearing fear any man. Any man. It, and when you look, you know, when you watch that clip and you look at his face and you can almost mm -hmm. look into his eyes and you can sense that he almost knows. It's like, I wonder yeah. if he had premonition or like he had a dream or, you know, maybe, you know, he was spoken to through a dream. Like, I wonder if he really knew what was going to happen to him. Because the way that he speaks about, you know, I'm not going to get there with you is in a way that I feel he knows like with, uh -huh. with some Absolutely. level of certainty that he is not going to live to see, you know, equality among all people, mm -hmm. but he knows that it's going to happen. And another quote that he said, not in this speech, but he said, you know, I mean, he did say in this speech, longevity has its place in your life. You know, obviously you want to live a long life, but it, he said in that documentary last night, it's more important to have a life well lived than a longer life. Right. I think that's the truest thing. And he, the fact that he really did seem to know that, I mean, between all of the racist people out there that hated him, that he knew were all like, would love to see him dead. He knew that. And he also knew that the FBI 
was threatening him. We'll get more into that, but they were threatening him as well. And I think that was also part of his fear. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Look I mean, what just had happened to JFK right before this. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think he knew there was a good possibility that somebody might come for him. And mm -hmm. I mean, obviously he's been, his house has been bombed. He's been yeah. assaulted. There's been a lot of things. He's known that he could be killed at any point in time. And he knows that there's people that hate him. Yeah. So, I mean. But it is interesting that he gave this speech the night before. I mean, it really does feel like he kind of had a premonition or some type of yeah, sense absolutely. that it was coming soon. Really eerie. It really makes me wonder about that. Because less than 24 hours later, on April 4th, 1968, at approximately 6.01 p.m., Dr. King was getting ready to go to dinner with some of his associates when he stepped outside of his motel room onto the balcony at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis. And as he bent over, he was shot in the face by a single bullet. We think he was like tying his shoes or something. And that's yeah, he, why he was bent over. Yeah. Like he was just leaning down to either pick something off the ground or maybe, yeah, like you said, tie a shoe. Stretch. And, who knows? And he took a very large bullet to the face neck area. Mm -hmm. I believe it pretty much obliterated his jaw and went into his neck and he died an hour later. Good evening. Dr. Martin Luther King, the apostle of nonviolence in the civil rights movement, has been shot to death in Memphis, Tennessee. Police have issued an all points bulletin for a well dressed young white man seen running from the scene. Officers also reportedly chased and fired on a radio equipped car containing two white men. Dr. King was standing on the balcony of a second floor hotel room tonight when, according to an, a companion, a shot was fired from across the street. In the friend's words, the bullet exploded in his face. Police, who have been keeping a close watch over the Nobel Peace Prize winner because of Memphis' turbulent racial situation, were on the scene almost immediately. They rushed the 39-year-old Negro leader to a hospital where he died of a bullet wound in the neck. Police said they found a high-powered hunting rifle about a block from the hotel, but it was not immediately identified as the murder weapon. How insane would you feel if you were at his speech the night before? and heard him say all that and then got this news the next day. Like how fucking crazy. Yeah, and people reacted exactly like you would expect them to. Oh yeah. I mean, people were furious yes, when they heard what happened. And, and mm -hmm. once they found out a potentially a white individual had killed him mm -hmm. and yeah, people went crazy and, yeah. and rightfully so. And his family talked about how hard that was because yeah. he would not have wanted that. That's no. not what he stood for. No, and, and yeah, even in that tragic moment, he would have been like, he would have rather people have just marched the streets and instead people started rioting and burning, basically burning the city down. There were even people that broke into his office and tried to steal stuff. And um, one of his good friends was there defending, like didn't even get to go to his funeral because he was defending the office and all these people taking stuff. But he said the people looked sad. They were crying. They were devastated. They were like trying to grab onto anything they could. To a lot of people, he was larger than life. He was someone that they could look to as a serious leader, someone, you know, more than a president or someone else that gets elected. I mean, he was. He's a spiritual. Yes, leader. I think in a lot of ways, yes, people really look to him to to save them in a way, you know, yeah. and when he was gone, I think so many people felt so hopeless that they felt like there was nothing else they could do but show their anger. How else are they going to be heard? And I understand that. Yeah, well, like the, you know, I forget his first name, but Carmichael, he was, you know, leading the black power movement and stuff. And mm -hmm. after, after Martin Luther King was assassinated, that really just like fueled that whole movement. It did. And, you know, that's how that got started. But, and honestly, I, I don't, I understand like everybody's entitled to be angry. And mm -hmm. especially when something like this happens, when it's so blatant that it's, you know, a, a racist assassination by a white individual who we later find out is James Earl Ray, as or far according to the official seems from story. the official story. Right. That's what people thought. Yeah, right. So I, I understand why people reacted the way that they did. Mm -hmm. It's just it is know, hard because people react with emotion. Yeah, you know I mean we're human course. beings. So, but Martin Luther King would not have wanted that, and he would have asked people to stop. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think so. So after Martin Luther King is you know whisked to the hospital and you know pronounced dead there. The police are on scene 
at the time of the shooting almost instantly because we find out that the Memphis police were actually surveilling Dr. King at his motel. So they were nearby, like right there when it happened. Now, when they actually went up to where they think the shot came from, which it was across, they knew it came across the street. Mm -hmm. And there's a famous picture of all his friends pointing up at this building across the street in a window. Yeah. It was kind of like a, a Airbnb type situation where you like rent a room from somebody. It was kind like, of, but a it wasn't Airbnb. Well, obviously. yeah, not Airbnb. <laughs> trying to relate to that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You could rent a room. Mm -hmm. So they went to that building and they found a bathtub and an open window where seemingly the shot had been fired from. Now, not too far away, they found the rifle that was used or possibly used in the assassination as well as documents containing information about a James Earl Ray. Now, who in their right mind would, if you did something like that, why would you then take the gun and take information about yourself with your name on it, put it with the gun and wrap it up in a blanket and leave it outside near the crime scene? Who would do that? No, I, I don't know. That's just like the dumbest thing you could do. It really is. Because... There's a witness that saw a white man run out of the, you know, the house or whatever mm -hmm. the living situation he was in, ran down the stairs. And I guess that person was really drunk at the time. Yeah, he was apparently a major drunk. And yeah. they don't know if his story is, it cannot be used as evidence, actually. Right. So there, it's very, it's not like he was able to identify, you know, an exact description or who the individual was. Or, or even if he actually ran. It's yeah. very possible he just wanted to be you know, feel important and get to be part of this whole story. You know, police came and asked him. It's it's possible he just said what he said. Right. But according to the official narrative by police, after the shooting, James Earl Ray wrapped up all the items in a blanket, which was a thirty out six caliber Remington Game Master slide action rifle, which if you don't know what a thirty out six is, this is a deer hunting rifle. This is a serious mm -hmm. rifle. I mean the bullets on these guys are I don't know, six inches or so, give or take four to six inches or so. They're pretty large. So it's going to be, you know, if that hits you, it's going to put a big old hole in you. So, you know, that description of, you know, basically exploded his face. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it did serious damage. It and really yeah. killed him very quickly. Mm -hmm. But when the authorities found this bundle, they not only found the gun, but they also found extra bullets, a pair of binoculars that had been purchased nearby that afternoon and apparently, as James Earl fled, he dropped it in the doorway of the Knipe Amusement Company. Like, right there in the... Why would... Yeah, just kind of like in a shop entrance. Like, I get you're on the run, but who would drop it right conveniently in front where people saw him drop yeah. the bundle? Like, and why it would has his that? name in the bundle. Yeah. It's just, like, absurd. It's very absurd. But that's essentially how they got the identification of the shooter. And that's when this massive manhunt starts for James Earl Ray. Now, as far as we know, he got into a white Ford Mustang and took off and was able to evade police and get out of town before he was caught. I mean, that that's also very weird to me, too, is that the police were literally at the scene. Mm -hmm. Already. Already. Yep. In any other situation mm -hmm. like this, the police would have a hundred percent captured this individual, and somehow he's able to get out of town without being captured. They know what kind of car he's in too. This is what's so fucking crazy about this, and this is what raises so many questions: is James Earl Ray goes on the run, and it's just blows my mind that it's for over two months mm -hmm. that he evades capture. So after he gets out of Memphis, he makes his way up to Canada where he's able to obtain a forged Canadian passport. So clearly he's got connections there or, you know, somebody's somebody's got to be supplementing mm -hmm. that passport mm -hmm. for him. And then he flies to London. He leaves the country. Mm -hmm. So you're telling me that they have the identity of the shooter, the person that assassinated Dr. King and yet he's somehow able to get out of the country, make it to Canada, who we have a great relationship with Canada. He's then able to leave Canada and make it to London, England. Mm -mm, doesn't make a lot There's of sense. No way. 
And there's more to the story that will help explain that, that we'll get to. Yeah, and all on fake passports. Absolutely crazy. But essentially, James Earl Ray is finally arrested at Heathrow Airport on June 8th, 1968, because of his fake passports. And then he's extradited back to the United States in July. So after James Earl Ray is arrested in July of 1968, it's not until March of 1969 that he actually, you know, his case actually goes anywhere and he pleads guilty to the assassination. And because of this plea, he's never put on trial. Now, there's a ton of contention with this because mm -hmm. we find out later on, and we'll get to that in a minute, that he recants, you know, this and says, I did not do this. Mm -hmm. But he's it seems that he's pressured into pleading guilty. And obviously this happens a lot where yeah. even if you're not the one who commits the crime, you know, you can avoid the death penalty in this case, most likely, or, you know, in other cases, a, a harsher sentence if you plead guilty. And I think he may have known that there's just no way that he was going to get out of this. Right, exactly. So, so as a result of pleading guilty to the assassination of Martin Luther King, he is given a sentence of 99 years in prison. But almost immediately after pleading guilty, he tries to rescind his guilty plea because according to James, he was set up by a Portuguese man named Raul that he had met in Montreal in the summer of 1967 after he had escaped from prison in Missouri. That's another crazy thing about this is he's an escaped convict and he avoided capture even before assassinating Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if it was just like different times back then. It was just no. way easier no. to like get away and like run no, around. I don't think it was it. He was saying that Raul was hooking him up. He was working with people. They were giving him travel documents and making it easy for him to move around. Right. Because he then went on to say that Raul was a gun runner and had actually given him the money for the Mustang that was his getaway car, as well as the money for the rifle that he had purchased in Birmingham. So Raul was this like mysterious person that no one knows if he actually existed, but James Earl Ray says he did. And it seems like this person was almost, ta if he's real, was tasked with finding someone that they could use who's already a felon who would be believable. And he was kind of groomed by Raul in a way. That's what it sounds like from his statements. Whether you believe him or not is up to you, but um, could it be possible that someone like that would come out of the woodwork and, and help you and give you travel documents and kind of set, set you up. Maybe someone that's working for the FBI. Right. Yeah. There, he could have been an informant for all we know, mm -hmm. or some type of, you know, black ops individual who, you know, he never even knew was working for intelligence agencies. And but. all he knows about him is that his name was Raul. There's no last name. There's no, he can't put, like tell anyone where he is. I mean, his name was probably not actually Raul if he existed. Right, exactly. He probably hid his identity too, James. And that and people are so quick to dismiss like, well, he's just make clearly making up Raul. There's no way could that be. he could be. But But this shit does happen. Yeah, and there's other evidence that makes this more believable. It's not right. just believing his story. Right. Well, James went on to say also that he was not even present at the boarding house where the shot was fired in the first place. And when you hear his history, I mean, he was in jail for a really long time, like 20 years for, I believe, a grocery store robbery. And he also had an incredibly racist past. He was actually supporting George Wallace at the time, who was running for president and was very openly running for pro-segregation. So he, according to documents, they believe that he thought if he did kill Martin Luther King, that he would be automatically, like, if George Wallace was president, that he would exonerate him from that. Yeah, exactly, which is... But we don't know if that's actually true, because he never said that himself. Yeah. That's just what the story, kind of the narrative is. Yeah, but he did spend, James Earl Ray did spend some time out in L.A. volunteering for George Wallace's campaign. Yeah, and he was 100% a serious racist. And it's also important, obviously... James Earl Ray, kind of a career criminal, but his crimes were always like petty crimes and mm -hmm. robberies. Like he yeah. definitely did some armed robberies, but it's not like he had this history of being a hitman no. or, you know, even committing murders or, you know, doing mm -hmm. more violent crimes in his past. It was primarily robberies that he was doing prior to Martin Luther King Jr.'s death. 
But James claims that he was not even present at the boarding house when the shooting occurred. Here's an interview clip with him. It's pretty interesting. So you heard uh, you heard the news on, on the radio? Is yes. that the way you heard yeah. it? So you were driving, you left that, that gas station at 2nd and Linden, what, about 6 or? I don't have any way of knowing. I think it's around that time, but mm -hmm. I don't even know if it's Linden. I know where the approximate area it is. And mm -hmm. the, I've seen the map on the Inquirer. And, uh, mm -hmm. and you were going back to uh, to pick up this man that you say is Raul? Is no, way? I just bring the car back. So you heard all this confusion. They turned and flipped on the radio. They said Dr. King's been shot. Uh, at that, did you think you were set up at that point? I uh, know I was headed towards toward New Orleans when I had the radio on. I used to keep the radio on. I think uh, I didn't have too strong feelings about the, the shooting. Uh, when when you met Raul, you did you you didn't know any other name for him. That's the name that he said was his, and that that's all you ever knew. Yeah, I guess not. Mm -hmm. And you met him where? Canada. Up in Canada. Yeah. And uh, and you just met in a saloon, or? It was a saloon in, in a waterfront area of uh, Montreal. Mm -hmm. You never became good friends then? Uh, no, I wasn't good friends. Mm -hmm. Just business. Uh, mm -hmm. These were all aliases, uh, I assume. Uh, you don't think Raul was a real name at all then? Uh? No, I've got some freedom of information papers in there saying there's Raul San Diego or something, New Orleans is supposed to be a him, but uh, I don't have the FBI. That's material from the FBI files, but I don't have no, uh, nothing to substantiate that. So you think their mind was made up when they got you? Well, it had to be made up. Uh, I, they couldn't, uh, well, I don't know what, if there's any penalty for uh, extraditing someone fraudulently or not, but I think, uh, I can see their legal point where they've got to stick with their story. Mm -hmm. So basically, his story is that he brought this car to a gas station for Raul and was at the gas station when the shooting occurred, so it couldn't have possibly been him. Of course, investigators maintain that his accounts of the day of the assassination are just inconsistent, and the story of Raul is made up. Right. Well, they said there's absolutely no evidence, and they've done extensive investigation that points to any other person being involved in the shooting itself. But then again, to me, this cl clearly looks like a professional job. Mm -hmm. I mean, the fact, and, and it looks like a frame job too, because I mean, he doesn't seem like the brightest individual. So no, he's like the perfect patsy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He is the perfect patsy, but also like on the flip side, could he have just been dumb enough to drop things he got? Because the police mm -hmm. say that he just kind of freaked out and like just dropped things and then ran to the car and took off. But, but also if he was that you know, I guess not smart and not he would have got skilled. Caught, yeah. I mean, but how did he shoot him? Right. Like he didn't have any skill to, to do this. It's not like he's a trained marksman. No. And I mean, he was in the military, mm -hmm, but not he, for sharpshooting like that. No, 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 no. And then again, the gun that was used was a 30 out six rifle hunting rifle, and it did have a, a scope on it. So you mm -hmm. could, you know, get a close up view. So the argument that the you know FBI says is that it was only 100 yards from the window to where Dr. King was. And with that scope, pretty much anybody could take a shot like that, which I'm like, I don't believe that. Uh, that's hard to believe because also in that moment, you know, you have to be somewhat skilled in order to point a gun at a human being and take an accurate shot. Like you have to have, you know, some training and, you know, discipline in order to do something like that and to you know, hit him while he's bent over on a balcony behind a railing seemingly. So who knows? I've, I've always been interested in like, did they ever go down the road and actually like look at the forensics behind it and look, you know, nowadays we would do, you know, mm -hmm. an, a reconstruction of everything and we'd actually be able to figure out the physics and, and see how precise of a shot it was. Mm -hmm. Because for me, I mean, even a hundred yard shot, that's not an easy shot. That's still a long ways away and just because you have a scope on a rifle doesn't doesn't necessarily make it easier because a if he had just bought this gun you know he would have had he would have had to get some practice with it right if you mm -hmm. just buy this gun and and he according to the shop where he bought the rifle the guy that sold him the gun mm -hmm. said that 
he just seemingly didn't know what he was talking about or what he was doing with it. No, he brought a piece of paper out of his pocket and said, uh, this is what Raul wants me to get. He actually got a different gun at first, brought it he to did. Raul, and Raul, according to him, told him to take it back and get something different. Right, to get the deer hunting rifle. So, and yeah, it's backed up by the person who sold him the gun. It didn't seem like he had much knowledge about guns. Right. If you were going to, you know, try to kill Martin Luther King, wouldn't you, like research and you it doesn't match up the way he was acting doesn't match up with an assassin you know yeah exactly not and saying he wouldn't wanted to have done it and he even admitted it there he was like i didn't really care much about the news of what happened so even if he didn't do it he's still i'm not defending him in any way he's a piece of shit but did he actually do it right yeah that's that's the big question the house select committee on assassinations actually conducted their own investigation into dr king's murder and they came to the conclusion that James Earl Ray assassinated Dr. King because he believed he would receive a $50,000 bounty from supporters of segregationist presidential candidate George Wallace, which I'm like, ah, I don't know, like $50,000 yeah. and, you know, life in prison or death. Like, yeah. I, I don't know. And there's no proof of that. No, of any bounty offer or at all. Or that he thought that. Right. The committee also believed that James could have had help but thought it would likely would have come from his brothers. James guilt was maintained by legal and governmental authorities and he was denied any retrials and just became known as the guy who murdered Martin Luther King. So there was a lot of people that very quickly came to the conclusion that they did not think that James Earl Ray was the one that carried out this assassination. And one of those people was William Pepper, who was a New York lawyer and civil rights activist who had worked with Dr. King and actually visited James in prison in 1978. And after he had met with James in prison, William was convinced that James was not the guy who did it. And this started a decades long project for William in which he sought to prove that James had been set up and that there was a larger conspiring force behind Dr. King's murder. William even defended James in a televised mock trial which aired on HBO in 1993 to simulate the court hearings that the convicted man never actually received. Evidence used in James' defense included the fact that the bullet that hit Dr. King did not have the definitive markings left on it that would conclusively match it to James' rifle. It was also the first time the convicted assassin was able to give a public testimony. That's the other thing, mm -hmm. too, is that the bullet fragments that they found was just consistent with a rifle of the same type. It wasn't even act, They weren't even actually able to tie the two together. So for all we know, the rifle that they found in front of the building was not even the gun that was used in the shooting. They can't definitively prove They it. can't definitively prove that. Probably was likely that gun though. Maybe, but the, sh the action, so if there was an actual, you know, somebody else that shot him, mm -hmm. chances are that gun was gone with the person. That's true. And, cause and have DNA. somebody else could, I mean, we don't even know how big this conspiracy goes. We yeah. don't know how many people were involved. So somebody could have easily dropped another gun that was not even used as well as documents with, you know, to frame him while the real gun that shot Dr. King is nowhere to be found. That's a good point. So in, in a lot of times, I mean, that's how they really get solid proof in cases like this is you tie the two together. The bullet should match the weapon from which it's fired. And mm -hmm. in this case, they weren't able to do that. So I know, I just think it's really interesting how many of his friends and family members believe that James Earl Ray is innocent. Of yeah. killing Martin Luther King. Yeah, that is a very important note. Yeah, so Reverend James Lawson assisted for years in investigative work in order to try to, to identify the truth behind the assassination. And after spending time with James Earl Ray, he was also convinced that he was not the person behind the shooting. And not only that, they knew Martin Luther King. They knew what he was going through at the time. They knew that the FBI was threatening him. That I mean, we'll get into that more, but yeah. they knew that this was a possibility. Absolutely. Well, things were starting to, the walls were sort of starting to close in on Dr. King as far from a, you know, a law enforcement perspective. Because now when we start talking about the FBI connection to all this, this is when things start to really get yeah. interesting. And like Kendall said, a number of the members of the King family also believed fairly quickly after this happened that James Earl Wright was not the guy. In fact, Dr. King's son, Dexter King, actually met with James Earl Ray in prison in 1997, a year before he actually died, and asked him if he was involved in his father's murder. James firmly denied any participation, and Dexter believed him. All 
of Martin Luther King's children believe that he was assassinated in a larger conspiracy and that it was not James Earl Ray. The fact that they're going to prison and talking to him, and, mm-hmm. and I think you told me that they even like hugged him at one I'm point. I'm pretty sure. I or like haven't seen the footage in a long time. Or friendly with him at oh, least. Oh, they definitely So were. that just shows you the amount of confidence they have yeah. in their belief that he wasn't the guy. Mm-hmm. That's... That's old. That's big. That is. I big. mean, for something like this, you would not expect to see see this happen. Mm-mm. And the fact that they are so confident about him not being the shooter, because, that alone should make people think. Yeah, I mean, they knew stuff that the public did not know about how the FBI was treating him. Yeah, and another person that obviously believed there was an FBI connection was Coretta Scott King, mm-hmm. because the FBI over the years had ex- harassed the family extensively. I mean, the sending them threatening letters and stuff. Mm-hmm. And we'll talk about what the, some of those letters are, but it became very obvious, I think, to the family that the F- if there was anybody that hated Dr. King, it was the FBI and... J. Edgar Hoover. Yep, the first director of the FBI. The government had been watching Dr. King since the 1955 Montgomery bus boycott. And in 1963, the FBI, under the direction of J. Edgar Hoover, undertook a massive surveillance effort to spy on Dr. King. J. Edgar Hoover was obsessed with finding any means possible to discredit him, ruin his reputation, and collect as many slanderous claims against him that he could so he could end his career. Because they were threatened by him, of course, especially when he's speaking to all these people and he really started pushing them when he started talking about the war, when he started speaking up about poverty, things that the government doesn't want to deal with. Yeah. And at the time, I think it's important to note that the FBI during this period of time was a a lot more powerful than I think it is now. And not only was J. Edgar Hoover doing that, but him and the FBI were Mm wiretapping King's phones at home, as well as at all of his SCLC offices as well as hotel rooms. Like they, Mm -hmm. they were watching him pretty much around the clock and they were collecting dirt on him, Mm -hmm. literally spying on him. Yeah. Which today would be completely illegal. Mm -hmm. I mean, what they were doing was definitely not something that they would be allowed to do today without, you know, the proper warrants and everything. I mean, Mm -hmm. for somebody that is leading a nonviolent movement, this would never be allowed. You know, this would not hold up in court, but back then, you know, they were able to kind of bend the rules and, and work mm-hmm. around things in, you know, their favor. Cause J Edgar Hoover had so much power too. I mean, the amount of power that he was afforded by, you know, the government was mm-hmm. immense and they definitely dialed that back after, after him. So they just wanted to, I mean, so J Edgar Hoover just wanted to paint Martin Luther King as someone who was a fraud was fake using the movement just to further his own fame pretty much um he wanted to peg him as a communist and also someone who was immoral that cheated on his wife which there is quite a lot out there about martin luther king he did have extramarital affairs and there's some other questionable things yeah which again i mean that doesn't necessarily no i understand the perspective that martin luther king you know, is this leader, you know, of the civil rights movement. And Mm -hmm. he's also using the gospel in order to help further his movement. So I get that they were trying, why they were trying to get the dirt on him about his extramarital affairs. They discredit him so people won't listen to him anymore. Exactly. Which then again, you know, no judgment there whatsoever. Because I mean, none of us know what it would be like to carry the burden of the entire civil rights Mm -hmm. movement on your back. And, you know, it's their relationship. It's their personal business. What happens in the bedroom or with other people or other women, that's really none of our business at the end of the day. It doesn't affect the work that he was doing or, Mm -hmm. you know, the way that he was helping the world by any means. I I don't think so. I agree. Unless you look at it from a religious perspective. But I think even then, I think religious people also understand that nobody's perfect. You know, Mm -hmm. We're, we're all humans. We all make mistakes. So, you know, and he was traveling a lot as well. He was never home. So... But, but he did love his wife and his family. Absolutely. I mean, he made a lot of mistakes, but. Absolutely. Yeah. But the FBI was just collecting all of this dirt. I mean, they, mm-hmm. they recorded conversations and every telephone conversation they would transcribe as well. So they just made, collected this huge file of, of dirt on Dr. King that they continued to threaten him with and mm-hmm. expose him. It's interesting that they felt so threatened by him. 
and the power that he had Mm -hmm. and how many people were listening to him. You know, he was more powerful than the president at the time in a lot of ways. Absolutely. I think more people were listening to him than President Johnson at the time. Mm -hmm. But in 1964, the FBI sent a package to the King home with alleged sex tapes of Dr. King cheating on his wife. Along with the package was a letter threatening to expose his affairs publicly. The FBI also infiltrated the SCLC, and in 1965, they started recording all hotel activity and transcribing everything. They even had FBI informants go and start working for SCLC in order to you know, continue to collect dirt, which would also give them access to put cameras and microphones in hotel rooms. They were performing a complete undercover illegal investigation on him in order to expose him. And at one point, Dr. Keem even met with J. Edgar Hoover face to face in a highly publicized meeting. And afterwards, the FBI wrote Dr. King a letter telling him, quote, lend your sexually psychotic ear to the enclosure. The letter warned that you will find on the record for all time audio evidence of your adulterous acts, your sexual orgies involving various evil playmates. It also went on to call him an evil, abnormal beast. The letter instructed King, there is only one thing left for you to do. You know what it is. You have just 34 days in which to do. This exact number has been selected for a specific reason. There is but one way out for you. You better take it before your filthy, abnormal, fraudulent self is bared to the nation. Hmm. Pretty damning stuff. Basically telling him to take himself himself out. Yeah. Yeah. Threatening him to kill himself. And you You have have 34 days. What the fuck? From an FBI letter. Uh Uh-huh. So, I mean, his speech makes a little more sense now, right? Clearly, he was fearing his life. He was. Clearly, his family members knew that that the FBI was a threat to him and that they wanted him dead. They literally said they wanted him dead. Yeah. And I mean, you can just see it on his face. You can see the mental anguish that he was going through. I mean, I think mm-hmm. he was really starting to fall apart there at the end because yeah, he, he was. was under so much pressure and mm-hmm. he knew one way or another, I think that this mm-hmm. was not going to end well for him, that his end was coming. I, I believe that. I, I really so do. Too. Also, J. Edgar Hoover once called Martin Luther King the most dangerous man in America. Why would he call him that? I mean, this is a civil rights leader. Why is he so dangerous? Yeah. Dangerous to the FBI? Because he was speaking truths. Because they were worried he would find even more out and continue to f- tell the people to fight back, to not accept this, to to be angry about, about Vietnam. That was a huge thing. When it came to his anti-war stuff and he was leading, he's a threat. Be- think of, there's not anyone today who is as powerful as Martin Luther King was, who can speak to that many people and make such an impact on the country. Right. And you got to wonder too, if there was people above J. Edgar Hoover that were also pulling strings here. Because to me, I mean, if that is truly the reason why J. Edgar Hoover was saying, you're public enemy number one, then what that, what I think about that is that there's people above him, potentially even above the president Mm -hmm. that were saying, we need to get this guy out of here. And they were tasking the FBI with that job. Mm -hmm. And that seems to me what happened was, you know, we talk, you know, we talk about the five families. And I mean, at the time, those five families are there, you know, the people that are running the world are Mm -hmm. saying, this person is going to take down everything that we built to put us into power. So therefore we need to take him out. Mm -hmm. The same kind of- You can't let someone become more powerful than the president. Yeah, and it could even be the same fucking people that wanted JFK taken out. Oh, it was. That took Martin Luther King out. I think it was. I think it's becoming more and more clear that that's what happened. What were they both doing? Speaking the truth. Yeah, telling the American people the truth. And I I think it was even worse for Martin Luther King because not only that, he was changing the entire country by desegregating, Mm -hmm. you know, the population. And, you know, that was a huge thing that did not benefit the elites and the white people in power. So I guess that makes sense that they, they wanted to eliminate the people that were going to bring the truth to the people. Exactly. About all the bullshit. He got too powerful. Mm -hmm. Too much influence. So then in 1993, there was a massive revelation in the case, which helped confirm for William Pepper and the King family that the official story of Dr. King's murder was not accurate. 
A man named Lloyd Jowers went on the show Primetime Live and confessed to having been recruited to help with the assassination plan for which James Earl Ray would unknowingly take the fall for. Mr. Jowers, did James Earl Ray kill Dr. Martin Luther King? No, he did not. Do you know who killed Dr. King? I know who was paid to do it. Was there a conspiracy involving more than one person? There was a conspiracy, yes, sir. Sure was. In 1968, Lloyd was the owner of the restaurant Jim's Grill, which shared part of the building with the boarding house from which James reportedly fired the lethal shot. The restaurant's back doors led to bushes that lie across the street from the Lorraine Motel, where Dr. King was killed. According to Lloyd, he had been approached by Frank Liberto, who had ties to the mafia, in order to help plot the assassination. Frank then had a package of $100,000 sent for holding at Lloyd's restaurant in exchange for his help. Lloyd also said a man named Raul then brought a rifle in a box to the restaurant the day before the assassination. And in 1998, Lloyd met with Dr. King's son, Dexter, and the former UN ambassador, Andrew Young, who was present at the time of the assassination. During their meeting, Lloyd identified a photo of Raul. He also made a taped statement in which he said that his restaurant was the site of the planning sessions for the assassination. Memphis police officer Morel McCullo, who later went on to work for the CIA, was also involved in the meetings. He also claimed that Lieutenant Earl Clark of the Memphis police, another police officer, and two federal agents that he did not know at the time were also present. Andrew Young identified the man kneeling beside Dr. King's body and the photo taken after the shooting as Morel McCullo. Morell had run to Dr. King after he fell and tried to stop the bleeding. Based upon what he would learn about the circumstances of the events, Andrew would also come to believe that James Earl Ray was not behind the shooting. In his statements, Lloyd said that on April 4th, right after Dr. King was shot, Earl Clark came to the back door of Jim's grill and gave him a smoking rifle. Lloyd believed that Earl had been the one to fire the shot, although he did not actually witness it. Lloyd then broke the gun down, wrapped it in a cloth, and gave it to Raul, who came by to pick it up the next day. Lloyd would maintain that he did not know beforehand that Dr. King was a target of the assassination plot and continuously asked for immunity. In light of Lloyd's confession and believing that there was a larger conspiracy involving the FBI, the mafia, and the local police, the King family filed a wrongful death civil action suit in Memphis against Lloyd Jowers and others, including government agencies. Attorney William Pepper, who had been investigating the case for years, represented the King family, and Lewis Garrison represented Lloyd. The King family was primarily seeking to uncover the involvement and the culpability of the U.S. government agencies who they believed orchestrated the murder. The government's sovereign immunity meant that one of its agencies could not directly be put on trial in a U.S. criminal court without the authorization of the federal government. As a result, the case was filed in a civil court. Of course they fucking did mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. They were not going to let this go before a criminal court. Nope, absolutely not. Some people have argued that a civil court has less strict requirements for evidence than a criminal court. Still, according to author and activist Jim Douglas, who covered the trial extensively and has also written about the Kennedy assassinations, it was the only way to bring a case against the government conspirators. That The government protected itself and the people involved. Mm -hmm. On November 15, 1999, jury selection began for the trial and testimony started the next day on November 16th. Jim Douglas, who was in attendance during the trial, found that there was hardly any journalistic or media presence in the courtroom. He recalled a conversation with journalist Barbara Rice, who covered the case for the Lisbon newspaper, where she said, quote, everything in the U.S. is the trial of the century. O.J. Simpson's trial was the trial of the century. Clinton's trial was the trial of the century. But this is the trial of the century. And who's here? That's what's crazy is like this was so under wraps. Mm -hmm. Most people don't even know about it. Yeah, that's crazy. I know. And I feel like for certain I never heard about this in school. Oh, definitely about not in this school. civil lawsuit and why there was a civil lawsuit brought against the government. No, you never even hear that there was no. a civil lawsuit. Didn't even make it in the textbook. Mm -mm. During the trial, Reverend Lawson testified that Dr. King's anti-Vietnam war sentiments made him enemies within the government. In King's speech beyond Vietnam that he delivered on April 4th, 1967 at Riverside Church in New York, he voiced major criticism of the conflict and of America's handling of the war. Reverend Lawson also believed that Dr. King's plan to host the Poor People's Campaign in Washington, D.C. the spring that he was assassinated angered those in power. 
The campaign would have shut down the Capitol until the government guaranteed the abolishment of poverty. That's the that's the biggest mm-hmm. thing here is that Dr. King was going to bring it all the way to the doorsteps of the elite. And mm-hmm. the elite were not going to let that happen. They were not going to be forced into giving up that power exactly. and promising the people that, you know, mm-hmm. were, because... Dr. King, I believe, was pushing for like a universal basic income. Yes, he was. He like he wanted to abolish poverty, and by doing that, the government would have to give you know everybody at least something to Some survive of, on mm-hmm, to mm-hmm. buy food, and the elites definitely weren't going to let that happen. And that's one thing I don't think people quite understand about this conspiracy is it's not that the FBI or whoever did this went after him because of his involvement in civil rights. It was more about him speaking out against the war and against poverty, about what the government was doing to our people and to other people in the world. Yeah, his movement was really kind of turning more anti-government and, you know, Mm -hmm. anti the people in power and empowering the people to vote. Yeah, that was his other thing was like, get, Mm -hmm. you know, getting black people and all of the minorities to get out and vote and like, Mm -hmm. let's get people into power that actually can change our situation. Right. Because the people that have been in power have been making it worse. As the trial came to an end on December 8th, 1999, after only about an hour of deliberation, the jury returned a verdict finding that Lloyd Jowers and the other conspirators were participants in the plot to assassinate Dr. King. You never hear that anywhere though. What? I know. It's not insane. People are blown away when they hear it. They're like, what? what do you mean? Yeah. Literally the jurors, based on the evidence that was heard, confirmed that there was a conspiracy to kill Dr. King. In a court of law. Yep. And a lot of people dismiss it and they're like, whatever, it was a civil trial. It still matters. Mm-hmm. So Jim Douglas, who is the author that you know wrote about the trial and everything, said To say that the U.S. government agencies killed Martin Luther King on the verge of the Poor People's Campaign is a way into the deeper truth that the economic powers that be, which dictate the policies of those agencies, Mm -hmm. killed him. In the Memphis prelude to the Washington campaign, King posed a threat to those powers of nonviolent revolutionary force. Uh Just how determined they were to stop him before he reached Washington was revealed in the trial by the size and complexity of the plot to kill him. And also, sorry to interrupt, but... And also writing in that letter saying you better kill yourself in the next 34 days. Yeah. They definitely absolutely. didn't want him coming to Washington. Absolutely. They were trying to put an end to it. Mm-hmm. Whether he did it for himself and made it easier for them or they had to get involved. Absolutely. He goes on to say that perhaps the lesson of the King assassination is that our government understands the power of nonviolence better than we do or better than we want to. Mm-hmm. In the spring of 1968, when Martin Luther King was marching, and Robert Kennedy was campaigning, King was determined that massive nonviolent civil disobedience would end the domination of democracy by corporate and military power. The powers that be took Martin Luther King seriously. They dealt with him in Memphis. 32 years later after Memphis, we know that the government that now honors Dr. King with a national holiday Mm -hmm. also killed him, as will once again become evident when the Justice Department releases the findings of its limited reinvestigation into King's death the government, yeah. as a foot soldier of corporate power, is continuing its cover-up just as it continues to do in the closely related murders of John and Robert Kennedy and Malcolm X. Mm-hmm. And Boom. those, yep, and those files are still fucking private. Boom. Yep. And the Martin Luther King ones aren't supposed to come out till 2029, which they probably won't. Because no. look, the JFK files were supposed to come out in 2017, 2018. I don't remember, but yeah. they came up with some bullshit and yeah. moved that forward. So yeah. and then we're even, probably never going to know. Yeah, we even talked about this on our show and like some uh-huh. of our early episodes about the JFK files. And, mm-hmm. you know, there was all this hope that Trump would release them or whatever. Yeah. And then he ended up, they released like a handful of things uh-huh. that, you know, didn't have all that much in it. There was actually a few things in the JFK files related to MLK as well. That was interesting. And that's how we found out some of this mm-hmm. uh, crazy shit the FBI was sending to Dr. King. And some people say that there possibly is information about JFK's death in the MLK files as well. So... <sighs> I wonder if those will ever come out. It's interesting that they have to set these dates and they say things will come out, but then they always move it. Well, it's just to keep us fucking waiting. Yeah. I mean, it's the way that they- Why is any of it private? It should never be private. These are people that mean so much to our country. Because they don't want us to know the truth. Exactly. That's that's what's happening. And people who just accept the narrative and just accept that that's cool and they, you know, have all this stuff secret and they're not going to tell us. I mean, what is, think for yourself, damn. 
Seriously. It's so obvious. I mean, these aren't like, we're not, it's not a reach to say that they were murdered possibly by the FBI or government. It is, there's so much evidence for both of them Absolutely. that they were. Absolutely. Overwhelming evidence mm -hmm. to the point where when the, you know, actual files actually come out, I don't think we're going to be that surprised. If they ever come out. Right. If they ever come out, I think it's going to be pretty clear that this is what happened. Mm -hmm. So despite the court's decision, you know, and the jury finding mm -hmm. this conspiracy to be what happened. The U.S. Department of Justice maintains that the conspiracies are unsubstantiated. Of course they do, like all theories. And they uphold that James Earl Ray was a culprit, and this continues to be the official story of the assassination today. However, the King family holds firm in their belief that Dr. King was a target of a multi-level assassination plot that involved the government and so do so many people we do included mm -hmm. i just think that really solidifies it for me that all of his family believes it absolutely if there's anybody that you know you would want to believe and it would be the king family mm -hmm. and it's not just believing in them without any evidence you know it's not just like hoping you know in order to make ourselves feel better it's mm -hmm. concrete evidence i mean and I just love how, you know, the government just likes to discredit anybody, you know, that brings forth anything against them. You know, they always mm, find a way to, course. you know, this Lloyd Jowers guy, they discredit him. They discredit James Earl Ray. There's, you know, there's mm -hmm. no Raul guy. And, you know, we, in the film that we watched last night, there was that one FBI agent who's just so pompous and arrogant in the way that he was yeah, talking he was. about. He's like, there was no evidence. We didn't find anything. It's like, Probably because you weren't ever they given any of the information. Yeah. And how are we even supposed to believe that when a lot of the files are still hidden? There could be evidence and we just don't know about it. Yeah. But there is quite a bit. I mean, we went over plenty of evidence for, I mean, once you understand this story as a whole, it all makes sense. It does. It makes complete sense. And I think the, the, and I think there was definitely a multi-layered conspiracy put too. together to do this. I mean, I think there was multiple agencies involved. I don't think it was just the FBI. You know, there's could have been military intelligence. There could have been CIA. I mean, there's, the fact they were all there already when yeah. he got shot. Especially the police officer, you know, that we mentioned, McCullough or whatever, mm -hmm. that guy. He was the first guy at this, you know, scene. He was giving first aid to King. And, mm -hmm. you know, meanwhile, who, who knows? Somebody could have went and dropped off the bundle of the gun and, and James Earl Ray stuff. And, you know, I, I don't know. And is James Earl Ray completely innocent in this? I don't know. I don't think I mean, you can trust an anything person. you say, mm -hmm. you know, really, but you know, did he kill Martin Luther King? Right. I don't, I don't think know. so. I don't think there's enough evidence to say that he did. There's no eyewitnesses that, you know, I deed him as a shooter. Mm -hmm. Somebody thought they saw a drunk guy thought he saw thought James Earl Ray run out. Could have been anyone. He just said a white man. Yeah. He never said, I saw James Earl Ray. He didn't pick him out in a lineup. Right. He just said he saw a white man running yeah. out of the building with the gun. Right. Could Which there's a ton of white men running around. So. so I don't know. I'm curious to see what you guys think about this. If you don't believe it, I definitely want to hear your thoughts and why. Um, of course, we want to hear multiple opinions here. But yeah, that's clearly you guys know how we feel. We really think this was a conspiracy. Yeah, absolutely. And it's one of the conspiracies that I really believe. Definitely. And I don't this think we right have up there the with true JFK story. For me. Absolutely. And it's just as important because yeah. it's just another example of proof of where when you know, you know, enough either about what's going on in the inner workings and in JFK's, you know, mm -hmm. instance and also, you know, saying that he's gonna release things mm -hmm. to the public and he's when you're gonna speaking tell, out, it's dangerous. Exactly. And you wonder why people don't speak out as much now. Like there isn't someone like. No. And Martin even on King. a small scale, look what happens to you. Mm -hmm. Look at Colin Kaepernick, for, for mm -hmm. example. I yeah. mean, this is very different. Very different. But, right. I mean, he gets mm -hmm. kicked out of the league and, you know, completely discriminated against mm -hmm. for just taking a knee. I know. You know, during in the national anthem. It's, it's just crazy. Like. It is. Hopefully we're seeing a lot of change though. It does feel like we're at a time where people are starting to listen in numbers that they haven't before. And that maybe, I mean, we saw with our intro topic today about Richard that we are starting to see some change. And I think Martin Luther King would be, it's hard to say whether he'd be proud or I think he would be encouraged that we are standing up in the numbers that we are and saying this is not okay. Yep. 
standing up and speaking out. That's what he was all about. And I think his me- message completely lives on. Yeah, especially, you know, all the people across the world that are coming out and marching and gathering in record numbers. I mean, we're seeing this, this is having a global impact and it's kind of like we're seeing a second wave of the civil rights movement happening right now. Yeah. And it's also just watching the film last night just made me realize we're like we haven't really come that far. After watching the King in the Wilderness film last night, it really became clear to me how much work we still have left to do. And we are really, you know, a part of the second wave of the civil rights movement. I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's great that it's really coming to the forefront now of all of our minds. And, you know, it's we're realizing that we still have such a far way to go and that it's just kind of been suppressed, you know, since Dr. King. And obviously we've seen glimpses of it, but as far as like coming together as, you know, the world and Mm -hmm. saying enough is enough and, you know, all people should be equal. Do you think if Martin Luther King was still alive today, we would be where we're at now or would we be further in the movement? Ooh, that's a really tough question. I mean, I think that at the end of the day, they were going to shut him down. And if he had survived and was here today, Mm -hmm. I think absolutely. I think we'd be way farther. I think he was so powerful did leaps and bounds like mm-hmm. in his short life that he lived i yeah. mean he he completely you know i mean everything got desegregated i mean yeah. we made major leaps and bounds that we didn't get to total equality and we didn't eradicate racism but we definitely at least under the government uh-huh. we got to a place where all were equal you know no matter your skin color and so yeah absolutely he had a huge effect and i think if he had lived to, if he was still alive today, it would be, our society would be in a much better place than it is for sure. I completely agree. And probably wouldn't be having all of this police violence and everything else. We would have had solutions maybe even done before we were born. I mean, the he world just could really be, knew how to organize people and he, get shit done. He did. And we haven't seen that no. in a long time. Mm-mm. Not at the scale right. that he was at. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Next week, we will be back talking about a true crime case. So look forward to that. But that's it for us today, guys. Stay safe and stay woke.